Well, good morning, uh, church family. I'm glad that you guys could uh, join us for another uh, live stream. Uh, looking forward to uh, getting together again in person. And in fact, um, before we jump into the message, I just want to bring you up to speed on where things are at um, relative to the soft reopening of um, Enclave for in-person Sunday gatherings. Um, there's um, a lot of things that are, uh, Lord willing, are going to happen this week um, that will help toward that end. Uh, for one, I think a lot of you know that we've been working on a sanitization uh, solution that is far more uh, effective than bleach, but also um, food grade. So you could spray this solution on food and, and eat it and be okay. So it's safe in, in that way, but also effective um, at killing viruses and bacteria and things like that. So we were, uh, uh, there's a process by which to make that and there's equipment that's needed to make that. And so that equipment has come in. We've done a test run of that and things seem to be looking good uh, relative to making that um, solution. Thanks to Jay Hyatt and um, others who have been working on that. Um, also, uh, we have developed a fogger to be able to distribute um, that sanitation solution. So on, on Wednesday morning, uh, we're gonna be testing out um, all of those things um, on site at um, Enclave, the building. And uh, so we're gonna see how that goes. So you can be praying about that. And then a little bit later on Wednesday afternoon, the elders and the deacons, we, we've been uh, meeting, we had one big meeting together. We've had little meetings in pockets at other times with different ones of us, but then we're gonna have another um, big uh, meeting. We were tasked with different things. Now we're coming back together uh, Wednesday afternoon. So sort of tie up some loose ends, process them through some details, discuss further some of the, the moving pieces that go along with reopening uh, Enclave in a, in a way that um, honors the Lord, honors um, the guidelines that we've been giving, trying to love our community, all these pieces that are honestly too hard for us to, to understand or put together. But, but we are trusting that God is helping us and we continue to look to him uh, for him to help us. So pray for that uh, meeting, uh, which Lord willing will happen in, on Wednesday afternoon. And then also on Saturday afternoon, Jay Fiorini is leading a team of people to put things to, together at Enclave um, to get ready for, for the, the reopening. So with all that being said, and, and by the way, uh, Jay Fiorini may not have contacted you yet to be part of that team. So you either want to be looking out for that or uh, turn off your phone for the next 24 hours. However you want to handle that news, um, you will be good. So with all that said, it's possible, I don't know about likely, but it's, it's possible that we might be able to reopen next Sunday on June uh, 21st. Remember, we, we gave the target date of Ch July uh, 5th and sort of submitted that to the Lord. And we said, if we can get um, things together before then, then we'll meet before then. So either June 21st, June 28th, or July 5th. Now, I think we'll have, my guess is, right, is that we'll have a better sense of, of when the actual date will be um, after our meeting on Wednesday. And so my hope is, is that I'll be able to, um, by email update, let everyone know uh, what was decided in terms of the date and, and let you know uh, what things uh, are involved in all of that. And so if, if you don't get an email update, so I hope to put that out maybe Thursday or Friday. If you haven't been receiving email updates in the past, this is probably the time to maybe sign up for those. So you can do that by contacting um, one of us. You can contact me. Uh, my email address is eternaltypelife at gmail.com. So type T-Y-P-E, eternal type life at gmail.com. And you can, even if you just want to contact me with questions or concerns or issues that have come up in your mind relative to the reopening, feel free to contact me through that. But then also uh, we can hopefully sign you up to receive email updates so that everybody can know uh, what's um, happening. So those are some of the updates uh, relative to uh, the reopening of Sunday in-person 
um, gathering. So be looking out for more information about that. So let's just right now take a moment to submit all of those things, right? Because those are our plans. But who Jesus could come back today, right? Those are our plans. Or he might have a whole other thing that we had never heard of before happen today. But so let's just submit all those to the Lord and then ask God to be with us as we turn our attention uh, to the message. Join me in prayer. Father, I thank you for um, your presence here with us. I thank you for uh, my church family. And um, Lord, uh, we, we just submit all these plans to you. We don't want to lean on our own understanding, but we want to look to you and acknowledge you so that you could guide us and make our paths um, straight. And Lord, when we begin to stray from that, God, just as a shepherd, pull us back in uh, to walking in step with you. Uh, Lord, we want to walk in step with you, not ahead of you or behind you, but in step with you. Lord, so Lord, uh, I, I pray um, for this meeting that we're having on Wednesday, that you would uh, give the leadership consensus as we all seek your heart um, together. Uh, be with uh, those who call Enclave home. Uh, prepare our hearts um, for this next transition um, back into a soft reopening that will be kind of like what we've seen before, but in other ways not like. And, and just shepherd us through that as we fumble like sheep um, following the shepherd um, toward where you want to take us, God. So... Lord, we really need your help. And Lord, we also need your help now as we, as we turn our attention um, to your word. Uh, Lord, and I pray that you would give us eyes to see the beauty of the Lord Jesus, that we would hear your voice as our shepherd, and that we would follow you and obey out, out of a heart that loves you and loves others as we are being changed by you from the inside out. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Well, probably uh, many of you are familiar with the phrase or the concept of déjà vu, right? It's a, it's a French phrase that means already seen. And we use that phrase to describe that feeling that we get when all of a sudden we feel like, I've, I've been here before. I've been in this conversation before. I've been in this situ situation before. It's almost like we realize that we had a had almost like a premonition of, of what we are presently experiencing. Now, one of the um, things that I've enjoyed a lot in terms of entertainment value, and that's sort of the measure that I'm using right now, is what has been put together by a group called Improv Everywhere. Have you heard of that group? So Improv Everywhere, its headquarters, I believe, is in New York City. It's basically like, like a club that you join, and it organizes surprise staged events in public. Right? So it happens all of a sudden, all of a sudden there's an opera in the middle of you know, Central Park, or all of a sudden uh, there's people frozen in, in Grand Central Station was one of them. It was an amazing one. I love that one. That's probably the most famous one. But the one that I'm thinking of, and maybe the one that's my favorite, was one that's built around this idea of deja vu. Now, when, when you belong to this group of improv everywhere, you're, you're an agent. That's what they call themselves. They're agents. So they sent several agents into this um, large, very busy uh, Starbucks. And I, I believe it was in um, New York as well. And, and what they did was that they created a loop of events that repeated like every five minutes and they did it 12 times about over the course of an hour. And some of the elements it included were like a couple would come into the Starbucks, they'd get in line for coffee, then they'd have this argument and then they'd leave. Right, so that would, then people would see that, they'd see the couple. And then they, this other guy, he spilt some coffee and then he had to like deal with spilling the coffee. And this other agent, he, he receives a cell phone call and then he goes by the window and then he, to get better reception for that cell phone call. And then there was a guy who came into the coffee shop, into Starbucks with a boom box and he walks through and then he leaves. And then there were other elements too, but all these events happened in a loop. 
and in sequence. And so they just kept happening over and over again. And per, you know, and you could see the people's reaction because they record all of it. So you pe the people are starting to wait a minute. I, I think I feel like I've seen the guy with the boombox before. What's happening? And then after you know three, four, five, six times, then people really start to catch on. The people in the coffee shop are talking to each other. One guy just starts standing up and is explaining like, and then this is going to happen, and then this is going to ha happen. And so the purpose of okay, so why would they do that? The the purpose of creating that whole thing is just for entertainment. Um, purposes just to just to mess with people. It's probably why I like it so much. I like to mess with people. But um, anyways, but the reason why I bring it up today is as we look at the passage that we're going to look at in Mark chapter eight, it, it might feel like deja vu for you, because we're going to see Jesus perform a sequence of actions that are almost exactly the same as we saw him do. Uh, uh, several months ago now, when we were back in, in, in Mark chapter 6, looking at the feeding of the 5,000. And so the question becomes, what's the purpose of this? Like, like, why would this be happening? Like the people in the coffee shop who are saying, wait a minute, what's going on? We as the readers are asking, wait a minute, what's going on? Jesus is doing the exact same actions again. What's going on with this? Now, I guarantee you that the purpose is not just entertainment as it is with improv everywhere. So let's let's look a little bit. Uh, let's look into the passage to see what the purpose is. So we're reading from Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. And this is how that reads. It says, In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered, and they had nothing to eat, he called, to his, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. Now in verse six, and he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, having given thanks, and he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd, and they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set out before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. So the fact that there are these two strikingly similar feedings of the 5,000 and then of the 4,000 raises a lot of questions for the readers. Um, today, I want to focus on three questions that I want to ask this passage. So the first question is, and this is the first point of our sermon this morning, is why does Jesus keep doing this? And in that point, we're going to be looking at some of the similarities between the feeding of the 5,000 and then the feeding of the 4,000. Now, the second question I want to ask is why is this event recorded at all? Like if there's already an event that's similar, why record it again? And to answer that question, we're going to be looking at some of the differences between the feeding of the 5,000 and then the feeding of the 4,000. And then the third point, which is the point that I personally am most excited about, is we're going to ask the question, okay, then why is it that it is it that it recorded here in the Gospel of Mark? What role does this play in the life and ministry of Jesus? And why is it placed here? in the Gospel of Mark. What role does it play there? So those are our three questions this morning that make up the three uh, points of our sermon. So the first question is, why does Jesus keep doing this? So for that, we're going to look at some of the similarities between these two feedings. Well, for one, it happens in a similar location. Both times that this happens, it happens in a desolate place. That's also translated in places, a wilderness, 
or a desert. So he mentions that three times in Mark chapter 6, but then one time here in Mark chapter 8 in verse 4, where we read, And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? Now, when you think about a desolate place or a wilderness or, or, or a desert, the image that should come to mind is not only like rolling hills of sand or something like that, like, a, like an actual desert, but any place that isn't conducive for human flourishing. It's, it's a place that is opposite of the garden. It lacks resources. There's no food there. There's definitely no stores there. And so people aren't there. There's no civilization there in a desolate place. But what we have seen before, and what I want to, what I want to bring out again, is that in the Bible, the wilderness has a very special role. It's the place where God took the children of Israel after he, after he delivered them from the oppressive hand of the Egyptians. And it's where they learned to follow and trust God. It's where God provided for his people what the land could not provide. It did, the land couldn't provide. So God had to provide for them in the wilderness. And we see that in places like Exodus chapter 16, where God causes mysterious bread to fall from heaven, a bread that we know as manna. In addition to that, and in concert with all of that, God was also humbling his people and testing them in the wilderness. And so we read passages like this in Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning in the latter part of verse 2, where it says, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger, he let you hunger and fed you with manna. So what's God doing? He's humbling his people and he's teaching them things about themselves and he's teaching them things about who he is. And the way that he does it is he deprives them of certain things. He let them go hungry. He deprives them of certain things that they maybe thought that they were bringing about, that they were causing to happen. He deprives them of those things, very central things like eating, right? So that he might provide for those same needs in a different way that they would know for sure that it came from him, right? And, and, and there I see a lot of parallels between that and, well, a lot of our experience of life, but especially now during a global pandemic, right? We, we have been deprived intentionally, I believe, of certain things. Right? And it's different things for different people. Right? We're, we're not exactly all in the same boat. We're all in the same storm, but we're, we're not exactly all in the same boat. And he's deprived different things from different people to humble us. Because maybe we have thought like, oh, we were the ones who brought that about. We're the ones who make sure that we have an in-person Sunday gathering every Sunday morning. Maybe even running in the back of the our mind, we thought that that was true. And then God said, okay, pause. I'm going to take that away, not because I don't care about you, because I need you to know where these things come from. And then he provides for that need in a different way that we didn't expect, that we know can only come from him. This is, this is often how God teaches us. So when, when we think about the wilderness, the wilderness in the Bible is the place that the people of God must go through. There's, there's not a way around it. You, you must go through to get to the promised land. Even in Deuteronomy and in, in, in verse 7, in the first part of it, it says, for, so here uh, uh, Moses is explaining why they have to have this experience, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. And then he describes all the the different aspects of that wonderful land that's not like a wilderness, that's like a garden, and it's full of resources but first he has to you have to know within you that these things come from God so that you can appreciate them with God 
So God is very intentional about wilderness experiences. So that's that's one similarity between the feedings of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. They both happen in the same type of location in a wilderness, and they both point back to God's provision for the people of God in the, the wilderness with the manna. And then John 6 makes that point sort of explicit for us. Now, another thing that is kind of similar is that Jesus has compassion on the crowd. And both uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, the, 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 the author, Mark, is making sure that we see that Jesus has compassion on the crowd. And so we read this in verses 2 and 3. This is Jesus speaking. I have compassion on the crowd because they have been, we, been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. Some of them have come from far away. So these people have intentionally remained. Actually, this is a variation of the word that's translated abide in John chapter 15. So they have intentionally remained with Jesus for three days now. So imagine that. They, they have bring, been bringing Jesus. They're sick. They, they've probably been hearing some of Jesus' uh, teaching. But now they're hungry. So Jesus notices that. And that's not insignificant. He, he notices that. And then he has compassion for the, the people. So we learn certain things about Jesus when we see him in this situation. Jesus often prioritizes spiritual truths. We, we, we've noticed that. And he often even uses physical realities to point to physical, uh, 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 to spiritual truths. But that doesn't mean that Jesus is not sensitive to the physical needs of people or that he deems them um, unimportant. Let me, let me say that again. Jesus often prioritizes spiritual truths, but that doesn't mean that he's not sensitive to the physical needs of people of people. And that's important for us to know. Because what, do you, what is Jesus calling us to? What does he say in Matthew chapter 6? Seek first what? The kingdom of God. But then we might say, but God like, we're mortal flesh like we need to eat. We need to clothe our bodies because we get clothed. And, and what does Jesus say? No, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Like it, Not like maybe some Eastern religious say, pretend like you don't have a physical body. That's not the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus is, seek me first, and I'm going to take care of everything. In fact, if you seek those things first, then you'll lose everything. But if you seek me first, then you will have everything, especially me. And I am basically everything, but I will take care of your physical needs um, as, as well. So it's important for us to know that as we follow Jesus, but it's also important as we think about how we minister to other people. Sometimes evangelicals find themselves in a very strange conversation where they're talking about, should we emphasize gospel truth, or should we meet the physical needs of people, or should we fight injustice? Which of these three things should we do? And, and all three camps have their proof texts, and they all point to their different proof texts, and they have this argument about these things. The reason why it's so strange is because when we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, Jesus seems to always be doing all three. <laughs> I mean, he sees everything through the lens of the gospel, so in that way he prioritizes the spiritual or gospel truths. He understands justice through that lens. He understands physical needs through that lens. But nevertheless, he, he ministers to the whole person. Now, he also does it in a special way. It, it's not just enough to do those things, to focus on those th three things. Because we can focus on gospel truth, the physical needs of others, and fighting injustice from a place of self-righteousness, from, from a prideful place. But Jesus doesn't do that. He does it from a place of humility. The king of the universe does those things from a place of humility, love, and compassion. Now, you, you can't just muster that up, right? You can't just, so it's not just about just correct, correctly identify all the areas in which you ought to operate. It's God has to change our heart to be like Jesus, to see people through the eyes of of Jesus, then we will know when to do what? 
as we follow him, our chief shepherd, as he leads us by his um, spirit. So these have profound implications for how we live and how we minister. So that's another similarity between the two feedings, Jesus' compassion on the crowd. But yet another similarity has to do with Jesus preparing a feast in the wilderness. He does that when we looked at uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and then now also here. And beginning in verse 6, we read, and he directed the crowd to sit down. So that literally means to recline. So he asked the crowd to recline on the ground. And he took, remember that word, he took the seven loaves and having given thanks, remember that word, he broke, there's another important word, <clears throat> them and gave, that's another important word, them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set before set them before the crowd, and they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. So in both uh, uh, feedings, we see several things. Jesus repeats several actions. He asks the crowd to recline. Right? So, and we've talked about how that is a, a position of being in a banquet. And it's the position that you would take when you took the Passover meal during this time, which is significant because when we talked about those important words, you see Jesus take, give thanks or bless, break, and then give. Where have we seen that uh, before as we've read through the Bible? Well, we're going to see it when we get to Mark chapter 14, when Jesus institutes the Lord's table during the Passover meal, during his last um, supper. So that meal, right, it points forward to his death on the cross as the pass, Passover lamb. And it also po uh, uh, points to the importance of receiving that death for yourself, into yourself, uh, which is part of the gospel message as well. But then it also points forward to the marriage feast of the lamb recorded in Revelation chapter 19 that we will experience all together uh, in, in the future. So when we consider uh, Jesus in the wilderness, right, <clears throat> not only does it point back to God's provision for his people uh, with manna coming down from heaven, it points forward to the Lord's table, which points forward still to the cross, which points to the ultimate provision of God in Jesus, the ultimate bread that comes down from heaven. John 6 makes this point, but then it points farther still into the future when you consider the marriage feast of the Lamb that we will experience all uh, together in the fullness of Jesus's uh, kingdom. <clears throat> and so he has them sit down. He uses these verbs that connect it to different things, but then he also has the disciples participate with him in this uh, miracle. Right? He takes what they have, what they give him, he multiplies it, and then he has them involved in distributing and then gathering. So Jesus, again, and he can take a little and make it into a lot. That, that's one thing that Jesus does. And so when we, when we ask the question, okay, why does Jesus keep doing this? Uh, part of the answer is it's because of who Jesus is. Right? He's the shepherd king who comes and leads us out of the wilderness, provides for us during the wilderness, and leads us to the promised land. And, and this is very important for me to remember because I've been waking up lately and the whole world feels like a wilderness. Now, there's been times in my past like where it felt like that personally in my own life, but now it just seems more global in scale. It's like the whole world doesn't feel habitable right now. And, and so what do we need? Only the shepherd king. Like we're, we're grasping at all kinds of things to try to solve this problem. But he has deprived us of certain things on purpose. Not so that we could try to figure it out ourselves in our pride, but to humble us so that we might look for his provision, his main provision, being the shepherd king himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the bread from heaven. So that's 
some of how we can answer the question of how, how come Jesus keeps doing this. But that doesn't really get at our second question that makes up our second point this morning. Why is this event recorded at all when we've kind of covered this ground already? Let, let me explain what, what I mean. Um, you know, don't you, that not all of what Jesus said and did is recorded in the Gospels. Um, and that's not just me saying that, right? The, the Gospels itself testify to that. If you look at the last verse in the Gospel of John, it says this in John chapter 21, verse 25. Now, I love this verse. Now, there are many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So in other words, the gospel writers are under no obligation. They feel no obligation to record everything that Jesus did. And think about how much he did. But they don't record everything that he did. So the question arises, so then why include this second feeding when it seems to cover the same ground? So I think the answer to that question comes from the differences. Let's look at the differences between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. The main difference being that this is occurring in Gentile territory. The previous feeding was in Jewish territory. Now we are in non-Jewish territory. So by all indications, Jesus is still in the Gentile region of the Decapolis, where he has healed a, a deaf and mute man along with many others who were there. The parallel passage in Matthew tells us. And the people in this area, it says, as a result of Jesus healing all these people, it says they glorified the God of Israel. In Matthew chapter 15. So it doesn't say they glorified their God. It says they glorified the God of Israel because these are Gentiles. In other words, the Gentiles were responding with more enthusiasm to Israel's Messiah. I mean, both identifying him as such, but then responding with enthusiasm about him more than even the Jews and especially more than the Jewish leaders. So that is very significant. But then there are other details in the text that point in this direction as well, that the fact that the crowd is, is Gentile. Now, now, some of these are not as obvious, and I wouldn't hold them with equal weight as much as the, the context uh, um, proving it, but I just submit them to you for your consideration. When, when Jesus says some are from uh, far away, that phrase is often used in the Old Testament in a technical way to talk about Gentile foreigners. We see that in the Old Testament. But then we also see it again in the New Testament when, like, for example, Peter in chapter 2 of Acts, he's, he's giving a sermon, and he says, the promised Holy Spirit is for everyone, even for those who are from far away, like Gentiles who are from far away. And then when you get to Ephesians chapter 2 in the latter part of verse 13, the Apostle Paul, he's addressing Gentile Christians, and then he says this, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of the cross, by the blood of Christ. So <clears throat> that might be another indication that this is a Gentile crowd. But then there's other details too, like when we think about the word basket. Now it's not evident in the English, but this word basket is different than the word translated basket in, in Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, the word there is a specific type of Jewish basket that they commonly use. Now it's using a more general word for basket. These are the kinds of things that like if you were listening to the gospel of Mark being read, you would be like, you might pick up on, on, on that. This is, he's talking to a Gentile crowd. Now, now there's another detail. Maybe it's controversial and maybe you won't be persuaded by it, but, but I also offer it for your consideration. Think about the numbers that are emphasized and these different feedings. In, in the first feeding, the number five is emphasized and the number 12 is emphasized. It's the feeding of the 5,000. There's five loaves that are distributed by 12 disciples who gather them up in 12 baskets. Now the number five and the number 12 are very important in Judaism because Jews consider themselves 
people of the Torah, of the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, written by Moses. So that's why five is important. And then 12, well, of course, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then we, you remember when, when the, the, the leaders of, of, of Israel, they sort of definitively reject Jesus and say, the work that you do is from the power of the devil. <clears throat> right? What's the next thing that we see Jesus do? He calls 12 disciples, this ragtag group, right? And they, in, in a symbolic way at least, they, they are sort of like this reconstituting of the people of God using the number 12, right? So that's the numbers emphasized there. But when we look at our passage now in Mark chapter 8, what are the numbers emphasized there? Four and seven, right? So there are um, 4,000 being fed, seven loaves, and then seven baskets retrieved. There's no mention of the number 12. There's no mention of the number five. Now, the, the, the numbers four and seven are more commonly associated with Gentiles, right? The nation of Israel, if you look in Deuteronomy, was surrounded by seven Gentile uh, nations. When you think about the days of creation, there are seven days of creation. When you think about the number four, the, the people are, of God are gathered from the four corners of the earth. So not all of these things are of equal weight, but... When you consider them all together, the point that Mark is trying to make by dropping these little differences along the way is for you to notice when we ask the question, okay, why is this event recorded at all when something similar was recorded before? It's because Jesus is not only the shepherd king of the people of Israel, he's the shepherd king for all who will follow him, Jews and Gentiles which is significant for us because most of you who are watching today are Gentile, right? So we are included in the, the plan of, of, of God. So that answers some of our questions that bring up in, in, in question number two, but even more when we consider our last question, question number three, why is this event recorded here in the gospel of Mark? Like what does it contribute to our understanding of the life and ministry of Jesus. Why is it placed here? So when we, when we think about that, we have to realize that this is the third of three miracles that Jesus performs in a Gentile area. After he has this spat with Jewish leaders over the issue of defilement. Do, so do you remember that fight that they were having? The Jewish leaders come and they say, why do your disciples not wash their hands before they eat? Right? And so they're, they're not like your mom that's worried about hygiene, right? They're, they're worried about purity laws. And we've, we, we've talked about that. And what, what was Jesus' reply to that? He says, defilement doesn't come from without. Defilement comes from within, from within the heart. And then he gives this parable. Do you remember it? He says, when you eat food, right, and think about the fact that they consider some food unclean. When you eat food, it doesn't go through your heart, but it goes through your stomach and then out your body. And then Mark adds this tiny, for us maybe enigmatic note. And in most of our translations, it's in a parenthesis. Right? And we didn't focus on it much when we were there because he's been waiting for this moment right here. <laughs> that note said this. Thus he, Jesus, declared all food clean. Now that, that might not strike you as significant, but, but just trust me that this tiny note in this cultural context was like a stick of dynamite that was explosive with its implications. Think about what this is all under the umbrella of. We're talking about purity laws. What makes things clean or unclean? And in the purity laws, as they were described in, in, in the book of uh, Leviticus, it talked about unclean food and it talked about clean food. Right? So what, what the Mark is saying is that Jesus in this moment, in telling this parable, he's saying those distinctions are no longer necessary. 
Now, that, that, that might not sound striking to you. But this, he's saying this to people who have regarded them as necessary and even very important, even part of their identity, for thousands of years. And he's saying, yeah, that's no longer necessary. Right? And, and it's like, man, whoa, tell us why, Jesus. And the reason is because it was part of a system that was to teach the people of God that they were unholy in an unholy world and God was holy. So just like Daniel said, there's this infinite gap, right? And so this, this taught us that. So we needed a Messiah to come from heaven, right? Like the manna that came from heaven to purify us. Now, the, the, the thing that makes this especially significant is not that there are now new menu options, right? I'll take the number three with bacon now. That's not, that's not the point that he's making. But the Jews at this time, they did not eat with Gentiles because Gentiles ate food that was unclean. But God all along, he had a plan for his kingdom that included all people, Jew and Gentile. So Mark eases into that topic with this one little explosive phrase, and then he gives three miracles that Jesus performs in Gentile territory. And then we're gonna start seeing pieces come together as we look at these different miracles, and we'll remember them. The first one being the Seraphonician woman, so you remember her. So Jesus come, comes and he expels an unclean spirit from the daughter of an unclean Gentile Seraphonician woman from a territory that was known to be bitter enemies with Israel. Like Jesus is doing stuff on purpose. Again, God is doing things on purpose. And so when this woman comes, remember she has a lot of firsts, right? She's the first to call Jesus Lord, and the whole gospel of Mark. Who's the first person who calls Jesus Lord? An unclean Gentile Seraphonician woman from the wrong side of the railroad shacks. Identifies Jesus as Lord, and even the son of David in the parallel passage in Matthew. So she identifies him as the Messiah of Israel. And as she comes with her request, she reminds Jesus, and this is from Mark chapter 7, verse 29, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs, right? Dog being a pejorative name for unclean Gentiles. So what we learned from that miracle was that Jesus's kingdom was not for people who already considered themselves clean because they followed, you know, the purity laws like the Jewish leaders, but for those who in humility recognize their need for cleansing from Jesus, right? So we learned that that was the first one. Now the second miracle that Jesus performs in Gentile territory was happened when we were together last time when Jesus heals the deaf mute man in the Gentile area of the Decapolis. And remember, he is described as having a speech impediment, which, which we said is a very significant word because it's only used once in the entire New Testament and only used one other time in the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 35. So there's that, there's that verbal link but then there's also the conceptual link of, like in both places, it talks about the, the mute uh, speaking, the deaf hearing, and all the infirmities uh, being healed. So, so Mark casts a line back into the Old Testament, hooks it on to Mark chapter 35, and drags the whole context of Mark 35 into this present moment with this deaf mute man in the Gentile area of the Decapolis so that we can read them in light of each other. And then that's when it gets really exciting because we talked about how in Isaiah chapter 35, which is quickly becoming one of my favorite passages, a highway emerges in the middle of the wilderness called the way of holiness. Now the unclean don't go on it, but those ransomed of the Lord go on it on their way back singing to Zion. So think of, okay, now this is all happening under the context of, of a discussion about what makes something clean or unclean. Now in Isaiah, the category isn't unclean and clean. 
the category is unclean and those ransomed by the Lord. It's those God makes clean and brings into um, Zion. And so think about the significance of that in this spat that Jesus is having with the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders thought that they were on that highway. Why? Because they kept the purity laws. Right? And Jesus is saying, no, that's not the way it works. Actually, actually, the highway in Isaiah 35 is me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm the way, and I'm the one who will take you from the wilderness into the promised land. And that brings us to our third miracle. The miracle that we're looking at this morning. The third miracle that happens in a Gentile area. The feeding of the 4,000. Are you seeing sort of the pieces coming together? What is Jesus doing? He is showing that the Gentiles aren't just going to eat crumbs under the table. <laughs> like the Seraphonician said. They're actually going to be treated exactly the same. Like Mark painstakingly has all the details almost exactly the same for us to realize this point that Jesus wants to be the redeemer of all peoples, right? To lead all of us from the wilderness to the promised land and to provide plenty for all. Now, this is significant for the readers of Mark because who are they? They're first century Christians. What's one of the biggest issues that they're facing as the church? Right? There's a Jerusalem council about this in Acts chapter 15. There's lots of discussions about this. The book of Galatians is almost all about this. Is how, like, okay, so we have been separate. There's been Jew and Gentile for thousands of years. So God and Jesus Christ is making one new man in the church. Ephesians uh, um, talks about that. And he's going to build their identity and their unity around the person and work of Jesus Christ and not their ethnicity. Right? So the Jewish leader said, the kingdom of God is about whether or not I wash my hands. And, and God is saying, no, <laughs> no, it's not about that. The kingdom of God is about union with God and each other in the person of Jesus Christ. Not in tolerance. Like we, we should be tolerant of one another. But tolerance isn't powerful enough to bring unity. Only Jesus Christ and his gospel will give us the unity that we need. To bring people who are from all different kinds of, of ethnicities and backgrounds and socioeconomic statuses together as one in one church, that only happens in Jesus Christ. Now, isn't it amazing how God has brought us to this moment in Mark when we're going through this season in our nation? Remember when the global pandemic started, I didn't even know the reason why we weren't continuing in Mark. Just every time I sat down, it was like God was pointing my heart in a different direction. But God on purpose in this season has been showing us these three miracles where God is communicating in Jesus Christ that unity, the unity of all people is found in Jesus Christ. You want to solve the racial tension problem? The answer comes in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so the question comes for us, the question that came to my mind as I was reading this passage, okay, who, who is it? Because this is not just in your mind, right? Who is it that you eat with? Who do you commune with? Is it just people that look like you, talk like you, act like you, dress like you? Or is it everyone 
Jesus is inclusive in that respect. Keeping Jesus, if we put Jesus at the middle and even have to have hard conversations that feel uncomfortable about race or whatever you have, whatever differences we have, if we put Jesus at the middle and we all move toward him, God will give us the unity. But for him to do that, God has to open our, the eyes of our hearts to be able to see the Lord Jesus so that we can be changed as we gaze upon him. So let's pray now together. Father, we desperately desire to have unity with you and unity with each other. But we realize that that only comes in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that now, by your Spirit, you would open our eyes to gaze upon his beauty, and by gazing upon him, change our hearts. Move our hearts away from not having compassion to having compassion. Move our hearts away from not seeking justice to seeking justice. Move our hearts away from not seeking the kingdom first to seeking the kingdom first. Lord, we, we, we recognize that we have been walking in many ways in the wrong direction. And we're in the wilderness. We lack resources. Lord, come and be our shepherd king and lead us and provide for us as we go to the promised land, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.